Chapter Twenty Three from Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter Twenty Three. Mort de Arthur. Sir Mordred was left ruler of all England, and he caused letters to be written, as if from beyond sea, that King Arthur was slain in battle. So he called a parliament, and made himself be crowned king. And he took the queen Guinevere, and said plainly that he would wed her, but she escaped from him and took refuge in the Tower of London. And Sir Mordred went and laid siege about the Tower of London, and made great assaults thereat, but all might not avail him. Then came word to Sir Mordred that King Arthur had raised the siege of Sir Lancelot, and was coming home. Then Sir Mordred summoned all the barony of the land, and much people drew unto Sir Mordred, and said they would abide with him for better and for worse. And he drew a great host to Dover, for there he heard say that King Arthur would arrive. I hear the steps of Mordred in the west, and with him many of thy people, and knights once thine, whom thou hast loved, but grosser grown than heathen, spitting at their vows in thee. The Passing of Arthur and as Sir Mordred was at Dover with his host, came King Arthur, with a great number of ships and galleys, and there was Sir Mordred awaiting upon the landing. Then was there launching of great boats and small, full of noble men of arms, and there was much slaughter of gentle knights on both parts. But King Arthur was so courageous, there might no manner of knights prevent him to land, and his knights fiercely followed him and so they landed, and put Sir Mordred aback, so that he fled, and all his people. And when the battle was done, King Arthur commanded to bury his people that were dead, and then was noble Sir Gawain found, in a great boat, lying more than half dead. And King Arthur went to him, and made sorrow out of measure. Mine uncle, said Sir Gawain, know thou well my death day is come, and all is through mine own hastiness and willfulness, for I am smitten upon the old wound which Sir Launcelot gave me, of which I feel I must die. And had Sir Launcelot been with you as of old, this war had never begun, and of all this I am the cause. Then Sir Gawain prayed the king to send for Sir Launcelot, and to cherish him above all other knights. And so at the hour of noon Sir Gawain yielded up his spirit, and then the king bade inter him in a chapel within Dover Castle, and there all men may see the skull of him, and the same wound is seen that Sir Launcelot gave him in battle. Then it was told the king that Sir Mordred had pitched his camp upon Barrendown, and the king rode thither, and there was a great battle betwixt them, and King Arthur's party stood best, and Sir Mordred and his party fled unto Canterbury. And there was a day assigned betwixt King Arthur and Sir Mordred, that they should meet upon a down beside Salisbury, and not far from the seaside, to do battle yet again. And at night, as the king slept, he dreamed a wonderful dream. It seemed him verily that there came Sir Gawain unto him, with a number of fair ladies with him. And when King Arthur saw him, he said, Welcome, my sister's son, I weened thou hadst been dead, and now I see thee alive, great is my joy. But, O fair nephew, what be these ladies that hither be come with you? Sir, said Sir Gawain, all these be ladies for whom I have fought when I was a living man, and because I did battle for them in righteous quarrel, they have given me grace to bring me hither unto you, to warn you of your death, if ye fight to-morrow with Sir Mordred. Therefore take ye treaty, and proffer you largely for a month's delay, for within a month shall come Sir Launcelot and all his noble knights, and rescue you worshipfully, and slay Sir Mordred and all that hold with him. And then Sir Gawain and all the ladies vanished. And anon the king called to fetch his noble lords and wise bishops unto him. And when they were come, the king told them his vision, and what Sir Gawain had told him. Then the king sent Sir Lucan, the butler, and Sir Bevedere with two bishops, and charged them in any wise to make a treaty for a month and a day with Sir Mordred. So they departed, and came to Sir Mordred, and so, at the last, 
Sir Mordred was agreed to have Cornwall and Kent during Arthur's life, and all England after his death. Sir Mordred, he the nearest to the king, his nephew, ever like a subtle beast, lay countant with his eyes upon the throne, ready to spring, waiting a chance. Guinevere. Then it was agreed that King Arthur and Sir Mordred should meet betwixt both their hosts, and each of them should bring fourteen persons, and then and there they should sign the treaty. And when King Arthur and his knights were prepared to go forth, he warned all his host, If so be ye see any sword drawn, look ye come on fiercely, and slay whomever withstandeth, for I in no wise trust that traitor, Sir Mordred. In like wise, Sir Mordred warned his host. So they met, and were agreed and accorded thoroughly, and wine was brought, and they drank. Right then came an adder out of a little heath-bush, and stung a knight on the foot. And when the knight felt him sting, he looked down and saw the adder, and then he drew his sword to slay the adder, and thought of no other harm. And when the host on both sides saw that sword drawn, they blew trumpets and horns and shouted greatly. And King Arthur took his horse and rode to his party, saying, Alas, this unhappy day! And Sir Mordred did in likewise. And never was there a more doleful battle in Christian land. And ever King Arthur rode throughout the battle, and did full nobly, as a worthy king should. And Sir Mordred that day did his devoir, and put himself in great peril. And thus they fought all the long day, till the most of all the noble knights lay dead upon the ground. Then the king looked about him, and saw of all his host were left alive but two knights, Sir Lucan the butler, and Sir Bevedere his brother, and they were full sore wounded. Then King Arthur saw where Sir Mordred leaned upon his sword among a great heap of dead men. Now give me my spear, said Arthur to Sir Lucan for yonder I espy the traitor that hast wrought all this woe. Sir, let him be, said Sir Lucan, for if ye pass this unhappy day, ye shall be right well revenged upon him. Remember what the sprite of Sir Gawain told you, and leave off now, for ye have won the field, and if ye leave off now, this evil day of destiny is past. Betide me life, betide me death, said King Arthur, he shall not now escape my hands. Then the king took his spear in both hands, and ran toward Sir Mordred, crying, Traitor, now is thy death day come. And there King Arthur smote Sir Mordred under the shield, with a thrust of his spear through the body. And when Sir Mordred felt that he had his death wound, with the might that he had he smote King Arthur, with his sword holden in both his hands, on the side of the head, that the sword pierced the helmet and the brain-pan, and then Sir Mordred fell stark dead upon the earth. And the noble Arthur fell in a swoon to the earth. And Sir Lucan the butler and Sir Bevedere raised him up, and gently laid him betwixt them both to a little chapel not far from the seaside. And when the king was there he thought him well eased. Then heard they people cry in the field. And Sir Lucan went to see what that cry betokened. And he saw by the moonlight that pillars and robbers were come to rob the dead. And he returned and said to the king, By my reed, it is best that we bring you to some town. I would it were so, said the king. And when the king tried to go, he fainted. Then Sir Lucan took up the king on the one part, and Sir Bevedere on the other part, and in the lifting, Sir Lucan fell in a swoon to the earth, for he was grievously wounded. And then the noble knight's heart burst. And when the king awoke, he beheld Sir Lucan how he lay foaming at the mouth and speechless. Alas, said the king, this is to me a full heavy sight, to see this noble duke so die for my sake. For he would have hope in me that had more need of help than I, and he would not complain, his heart was so set to help me. Then Sir Bevedere wept for his brother. Leave this morning in weeping, said the king. For wilt thou well, if I might live myself, the death of Sir Lucan would grieve me ever more, but my time hieth fast. Therefore, said Arthur unto Sir Bevedere, take thou Excalibur my good sword, and go with it to yonder waterside, and when thou comest there I charge thee throw my sword in that water, and come again and tell me what thou there seest. 
My lord, said Sir Bevedere, your commandment shall be done. So Sir Bevedere departed, and by the way he beheld that noble sword, that the pommel and the haft were all of precious stones. And then he said to himself, If I throw this rich sword into the water, no good shall come thereof, but only harm and loss. And then Sir Bevedere hid Excalibur under a tree. And so, as soon as he might, he came again to the king. What sawest thou there? said the king. Sir, he said, I saw nothing. Alas, thou hast deceived me, said the king. Go thou lightly again, and as thou love me, spare not to throw it in. Then Sir Bevedere went again, and took the sword in his hand to throw it. But again it beseemed him but sin and shame to throw away that noble sword, and he hid it away again, and returned and told the king he had done his commandment. What sawest thou there? said the king. Sir, he said, I saw nothing but waters deep and waves wan. Ah, traitor, untrue, said King Arthur. Now hast thou betrayed me twice, and yet thou art named a noble knight, and hast been lief and dear to me. But now go again, and do as I bid thee, for thy long tarrying putteth me in jeopardy of my life. Then Sir Bevedere went to the sword, and lightly took it up, and went to the water side, and he bound the girdle about the hilt, and then he threw the sword as far into the water as he might. And there came an arm and a hand out of the water, and met it, and caught it, and shook it thrice, and brandished it, and then vanished away the hand with the sword in the water. Then Sir Bevedere came again to the king, and told him what he saw. Help me hence, said the king, for I fear I have tarried too long. Then Sir Bevedere took the king on his back, and so went with him to that water side, and when they came there, even fast by the bank there rode a little barge with many fair ladies in it, and among them was a queen, and all had black hoods, and they wept and shrieked when they saw King Arthur. Now put me in the barge, said the king, and there received him three queens with great mourning, and in one of their laps King Arthur laid his head. And the queen said, Ah, dear brother, why have ye tarried so long? Alas, this wound on your head hath caught overmuch cold. And then they rode from the land, and Sir Bevedere beheld them go from him. Then he cried, Ah, my lord Arthur, will ye leave me here alone among mine enemies? Comfort thyself, said the king, for in me there is no further help, for I will to the isle of Avalon to heal me of my grievous wound. And as soon as Sir Bevedere had lost sight of the barge, he wept and wailed. Then he took the forest, and went all that night, and in the morning he was ware of a chapel and a hermitage. Then went Sir Bevedere thither, and when he came into the chapel, he saw where lay a hermit on the ground, near a tomb that was newly graven. Sir, said Sir Bevedere, what man is there buried that ye pray so near unto? Fair son, said the hermit, I know not verily, but this night there came a number of ladies, and brought hither one dead, and prayed me to bury him. Alas, said Sir Bevedere, that was my lord, King Arthur. Then Sir Bevedere swooned, and when he awoke he prayed the hermit he might abide with him, to live with fasting and prayers. Ye are welcome, said the hermit, so there bowed Sir Bevedere with the hermit. And he put on poor clothes, and served the hermit full lowly in fasting and in prayers. Thus of Arthur I find never more written in books that be authorized, nor more of the very certainty of his death, but thus was he led away in a ship, wherein were three queens, and one was King Arthur's sister, Queen Morgan le Fay, the other was Viviane, the Lady of the Lake, and the third was the Queen of North Gallus. And this tale Sir Bevedere, Knight of the Table Round, made to be written. Yet some men say that King Arthur is not dead, but hid away into another place, and men say that he shall come again and reign over England. But many say that there is written on his tomb this verse, Hi facet Arthurus, rex quondam, rex que futurus. Here Arthur lies, king once, and king to be. And when Queen Guinevere understood that King Arthur was slain, and all the noble knights with him, she stole away, and five ladies with her, 
and so she went to Almsbury, and made herself a nun, and wear white clothes and black, and took great penance as ever did sinful lady, and lived in fasting, prayers, and almsdeeds. And there she was abbess and ruler of the nuns. And when she came to Almsbury, she spake there to the nuns and said, Mine enemies pursue me, but, O peaceful sisterhood, receive, and yield me sanctuary, nor ask her name to whom ye yield it, till her time to tell you. And her beauty, grace, and power wrought as a charm upon them, and they spared to ask it. Guinevere. Now turn we from her, and speak of Sir Launcelot of the lake. When Sir Launcelot heard in his country that Sir Mordred was crowned king of England, and made war against his own uncle, King Arthur, then was Sir Launcelot wroth out of measure, and said to his kinsmen, Alas, that double traitor, Sir Mordred! Now it repenteth me that ever he escaped out of my hands. Then Sir Launcelot and his fellows made ready in all haste, with ships and galleys, to pass into England, and so he passed over till he came to Dover, and there he landed with a great army. Then Sir Launcelot was told that King Arthur was slain. Alas, said Sir Launcelot, this is the heaviest tidings that ever came to me. Then he called the kings, dukes, barons, and knights, and said thus, My fair lords, I thank you all for coming into this country with me, but we came too late, and that shall repent me while I live. But since it is so, said Sir Launcelot, I will myself ride and seek my lady, Queen Guinevere, for I have heard say she hath fled into the west. Therefore ye shall abide me here fifteen days, and if I come not within that time, then take your ships and your host, and depart into your country. So Sir Launcelot departed and rode westerly, and there he sought many days, and at last he came to a nunnery, and was seen of Queen Guinevere as he walked in the cloister, and when she saw him she swooned away, and when she might speak, she bade him to be called to her. And when Sir Launcelot was brought to her, she said, Sir Launcelot, I require thee and beseech thee, for all the love that ever was betwixt us, that you never see me more, but return to thy kingdom and take thee a wife, and live with her with joy and bliss, and pray for me to my lord, that I may get my soul's health. Nay, madam, said Sir Launcelot, wit you well that I shall never do but the same destiny that ye have taken you to, will I take me unto, for to please and serve God. And so they parted, with tears and much lamentation, and the ladies bare the queen to her chamber, and Sir Launcelot took his horse and rode away weeping. And at last Sir Launcelot was ware of a hermitage and a chapel, and then he heard a little bell ring to mass, and thither he rode and alighted, and tied his horse to the gate, and heard mass and he that sang the mass was the hermit with whom Sir Bevedere had taken up his abode, and Sir Bevedere knew Sir Launcelot, and they spake together after mass. But when Sir Bevedere had told his tale, Sir Launcelot's heart almost burst for sorrow. Then he kneeled down, and prayed the hermit to shrive him, and besought that he might be his brother. Then the hermit said, I will gladly, and then he put a habit upon Sir Launcelot, and there he served God day and night, with prayers and fastings. And the great host abode at Dover till the end of the fifteen days set by Sir Launcelot, and then Sir Bohort made them to go home again to their own country, and Sir Bohort, Sir Hector de Marys, Sir Blamore, and many others, took on them to ride through all England to seek Sir Launcelot. So Sir Bohort by fortune rode until he came to the same chapel where Sir Launcelot was, and when he saw Sir Launcelot in that manner of clothing, he prayed the hermit that he might be in that same. And so there was an habit put upon him, and there he lived in prayers and fasting. And within half a year came others of the knights, their fellows, and took such a habit as Sir Launcelot and Sir Bohort had. Thus they endured in great penance six years." and upon a night there came a vision to Sir Launcelot, and charged him to haste towards Almsbury, and, quote, by the time thou come there, thou shalt find Queen Guinevere dead, end quote. Then Sir Launcelot rose up early, and told the hermit thereof. Then said the hermit, It were well that ye disobey not this vision. 
and Sir Launcelot took his seven companions with him, and on foot they went from Glastonbury to Almsbury, which is more than thirty miles. And when they were come to Almsbury, they found that Queen Guinevere died but half an hour before. Then Sir Launcelot saw her visage, but he wept not greatly, but sighed. And so he did all the observance of the service himself, both the dirge at night, and at morn he sang mass. And there was prepared an horse beer, and Sir Launcelot and his fellows followed the beer on foot from Almsbury, until they came to Glastonbury. And she was wrapped in seared clothes, and laid in a coffin of marble. And when she was put in the earth, Sir Launcelot swooned, and lay long as one dead. And Sir Launcelot never after ate but little meat, nor drank, but continually mourned. And within six weeks Sir Launcelot fell sick, and he sent for the hermit and all his true fellows, and said, Sir Hermit, I pray you give me all my rights that a Christian man ought to have. It shall not need, said the hermit and all his fellows. It is but heaviness of your blood, and to-morrow morn you shall be well. My fair lords, said Sir Launcelot, my careful body will into the earth. I have warning more than now I will say. Therefore give me my rights. So when he was houseled and annulled, and had all that a Christian man ought to have, he prayed the hermit that his fellows might bear his body to joyous guard. Some men say it was Alnwick, and some say it was Bamborough. It repenteth me sore, said Sir Launcelot, but I made a vow aforetime that in joyous guard I would be buried. Then there was weeping and wringing of hands among his fellows, and that night Sir Launcelot died, and when Sir Bohort and his fellows came to his bedside the next morning, they found him stark dead, and he lay as if he had smiled, and the sweetest savour all about him that ever they knew. And they put Sir Launcelot into the same horse-bier that Queen Guinevere was laid in, and the hermit and they all together went with the body, till they came to joyous guard. And there they laid his corpse in the body of the choir, and sang and read many psalms and prayers over him, and ever his visage was laid open and naked, that all folks might behold him. And right thus, as they were at their service, there came Sir Hector de Maris, that had seven years sought Sir Lancelot, his brother, through all England, Scotland, and Wales. And when Sir Hector heard such sounds in the chapel of Joyous Guard, he alighted and came into the choir. And all they knew Sir Hector. Then went Sir Bohort, and told him how there lay Sir Launcelot his brother, dead. Then Sir Hector threw his shield, his sword, and helm from him. And when he beheld Sir Launcelot's visage, it were hard for any tongue to tell the doleful complaints he made for his brother. Ah, Sir Launcelot, he said, there thou liest, and now I dare to say thou wert never matched of none earthly knight's hand, and thou wert the courteousest knight that ever bare shield, and thou wert the truest friend of thy lover that ever bestrode horse, and thou wert the truest lover of a sinful man that ever loved woman, and thou wert the kindest man that ever struck with sword, and thou wert the goodliest person that ever came among press of knights and thou wert the meekest man and the gentlest that ever ate in hall among ladies. And thou wert the sternest knight to thy mortal foe that ever put spear in the rest. Then there was weeping and dolor out of measure. Thus they kept Sir Launcelot's corpse fifteen days, and then they buried it with great devotion. Then they went back with the hermit to his hermitage, and Sir Bevedere was there ever still hermit to his life's end and Sir Bohort, Sir Hector, Sir Blamor, and Sir Bleoberus went into the Holy Land, and these four knights did many battles upon the miscreants, the Turks, and there they died upon a good Friday, as it pleased God. Thus endeth this noble and joyous book, entitled La Morte de Arthur, notwithstanding it treateth of the birth, life, and acts of the said King Arthur, and of his noble knights of the Round Table, their marvellous enquests and adventures, the achieving of the Sangreal, and, in the end, La Morte de Arthur, with the dolorous death and departing out of this world of them all. Which book was reduced into English by Sir Thomas Mallory, Knight, and divided into twenty-one books, chaptered and imprinted and finished in the Abbey Westminster, the last day of July, the year of our Lord, 1485. 
Caxton may Fieri Fesset. End of chapter 23《Nogion》Introduction and Chapter One from Bullfinch's *The Age of Chivalry*. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. *The Age of Chivalry* by Thomas Bullfinch. *The Mabinogion* Introductory Note and Chapter One: The Britons. *The Mabinogion* Introductory Note. It has been well known to the literati and antiquarians of Europe that there exist in the great public libraries voluminous manuscripts of romances and tales once popular, but which, on the invention of printing, had already become antiquated, and fallen into neglect. They were therefore never printed, and seldom perused even by the learned, until about half a century ago, when attention was again directed to them and they were found very curious monuments of ancient manners, habits, and modes of thinking. Several have since been edited, some by individuals, as Sir Walter Scott and the poet Southey, others by antiquarian societies. The class of readers which could be counted on for such publications was so small, that no inducement of profit could be found to tempt editors and publishers to give them to the world. It was therefore only a few, and those the most accessible, which were put in print. There was a class of manuscripts of this kind which were known, or rather suspected, to be both curious and valuable, but which it seemed almost hopeless to expect ever to see in fair printed English. These were the Welsh popular tales called Mabinogion, a plural word, the singular being Mabinogi, a tale. Manuscripts of these were contained in the Bodleian Library at Oxford and elsewhere but the difficulty was to find translators and editors. The Welsh is a spoken language among the peasantry of Wales, but is entirely neglected by the learned, unless they are natives of the principality. Of the few Welsh scholars none were found who took sufficient interest in this branch of learning to give these publications to the English public. Southey and Scott, and others, who, like them, loved the old romantic legends of their country, often urged upon the Welsh literati the duty of reproducing the Mabinogion. Southey, in the preface of his edition of Morted Arthur, says, The specimens which I have seen are exceedingly curious, nor is there a greater desideratum in British literature than an edition of these tales, with a literal version, and such comments as Mr. Davies, of all men, is best qualified to give. Certain it is that many of the round-table fictions originated in Wales, or in Britannia, and probably might still be traced there. Again, in a letter to Sir Charles W. W. Wynne, dated 1819, he says, I begin almost to despair of ever seeing more of the Mabinogion, and yet if some competent Welshman could be found to edit it carefully, with as literal a version as possible, I am sure it might be made worth his while by a subscription, printing a small edition at a high price, perhaps two hundred at five guineas. I myself would gladly subscribe at that price per volume for such an edition of the whole of your genuine remains in prose and verse. Till some such collection is made, the gentlemen of Wales ought to be prohibited from wearing a leek, aye, and interdicted from toasted cheese also. Your bards would have met with better usage if they had been Scotchmen. Sharon Turner and Sir Walter Scott also expressed a similar wish for the publication of the Welsh manuscripts. The former took part in an attempt to effect it, through the instrumentality of a Mr. Owen, a Welshman, but, we judge, by what Southey says of him, imperfectly acquainted with English. Southey's language is William Owen lent me three parts of the Mabinogion, delightfully translated into so Welsh an idiom and syntax that such a translation is as instructive as an original. In another letter he adds, Let Sharon make his language grammatical, but not alter their idiom in the slightest point. It is probable Mr. Owen did not proceed far in an undertaking which, so executed, could expect but little popular patronage. It was not till an individual should appear possessed of the requisite knowledge of the two languages, of enthusiasm sufficient for the task, and of pecuniary resources sufficient to be independent of the booksellers and of the reading public, that such a work could be confidently expected. Such an individual has, since Southey's day and Scott's, appeared in the person of Lady Charlotte Guest, 
an English lady, united to a gentleman of property in Wales, who, having acquired the language of the principality, and become enthusiastically fond of its literary treasures, has given them to the English reader, in a dress which the printer's and the engraver's arts have done their best to adorn. In four royal octavo volumes containing the Welsh originals, the translation, and ample illustrations from French, German, and other contemporary and affiliated literature, the Mabinogion is spread before us. To the antiquarian and the student of language, and ethnology, an invaluable treasure, yet it can hardly in such a form win its way to popular acquaintance. We claim no other merit than that of bringing it to the knowledge of our readers, of abridging its details, of selecting its most attractive portions, and of faithfully preserving throughout the style in which Lady Guest has clothed her legends. For this service we hope that our readers will confess we have laid them under no light obligation. CHAPTER I. THE BRITONS the earliest inhabitants of Britain are supposed to have been a branch of that great family known in history by the designation of Celts. Cambria, which is a frequent name for Wales, is thought to be derived from Cymru, the name which the Welsh traditions apply to an immigrant people who entered the island from the adjacent continent. This name is thought to be identical with those of Cimmerians and Cimbri, under which the Greek and Roman historians describe a barbarous people, who spread themselves from the north of the Euxine over the whole of northwestern Europe. The origin of the names Wales and Welsh has been much canvassed. Some writers make them a derivation from Gael or Gaul, which names are said to signify woodlanders. Others observe that Walsh, in the northern languages, signifies a stranger, and that the aboriginal Britons were so called by those who, at a later era, invaded the island and possessed the greater part of it, the Saxons and Angles. The Romans held Britain from the invasion of Julius Caesar till their voluntary withdrawal from the island, A.D. 420, that is, about five hundred years. In that time there must have been a wide diffusion of their arts and institutions among the natives. The remains of roads, cities, and fortifications show that they did much to develop and improve the country, while those of their villas and castles prove that many of the settlers possessed wealth and taste for the ornamental arts yet the Roman sway was sustained chiefly by force, and never extended over the entire island. The northern portion, now Scotland, remained independent, and the western portion, constituting Wales and Cornwall, was only nominally subjected. Neither did the later invading hordes succeed in subduing the remoter sections of the island. For ages after the arrival of the Saxons under Hengist and Horsa, A.D. 449, the whole western coast of Britain, was possessed by the aboriginal inhabitants, engaged in constant warfare with the invaders. It has, therefore, been a favourite boast of the people of Wales and Cornwall, that the original British stock flourishes in its unmixed purity only among them. We see this notion flashing out in poetry occasionally, as when Grey, in The Bard, prophetically describing Queen Elizabeth, who was of the Tudor, a Welsh race, says, Her eye proclaims her of the Britain line and, contrasting the princes of the Tudor with those of the Norman race, he exclaims, All hail, ye genuine kings, Britannia's issue, hail. THE WELSH LANGUAGE AND LITERATURE The Welsh language is one of the oldest in Europe. It possesses poems, the original of which is referred with probability to the sixth century. The language of some of these is so antiquated that the best scholars differ about the interpretation of many passages, but generally speaking, the body of poetry, which the Welsh possess, from the year 1000 downwards, is intelligible to those who are acquainted with the modern language. Till within the last half-century these compositions remained buried in the libraries of colleges or of individuals, and so difficult of access that no successful attempt was made to give them to the world. This reproach was removed after ineffectual appeals to the patriotism of the gentry of Wales, by Owen Jones, a furrier of London, who at his own expense collected and published the chief productions of Welsh literature, under the title of the Mervurian Archaeology of Wales. In this task he was assisted by Dr. Owen and other Welsh scholars. After the cessation of Jones's exertions the old apathy returned, and continued till within a few years. Dr. Owen exerted himself to obtain support for the publication of the Mabinogian, or Prose Tales of the Welsh, but died without accomplishing his purpose, which has since been carried into execution by Lady Charlotte Guest. 
The legends which fill the remainder of this volume are taken from this work, of which we have already spoken more fully in the introductory chapter to the first part. THE WELSH BARDS The authors to whom the oldest Welsh poems are attributed are Anurian, who is supposed to have lived A.D. 500 to 550, and Taliesin, Thowarken, Thowark the Aged, and Merdin, or Merlin, who were a few years later. The authenticity of the poems which bear their names has been assailed, and it is still an open question how many and which of them are authentic, though it is hardly to be doubted that some are so. The poem of Anurian, entitled The Gododin, bears very strong marks of authenticity. Anurin was one of the northern Britons of Strathclyde, who have left to that part of the district they inhabited the name of Cumberland, or Land of the Cymry. In this poem he laments the defeat of his countrymen by the Saxons at the Battle of Catrich, in consequence of having partaken too freely of the mead before joining in combat. The bard himself and two of his fellow warriors were all who escaped from the field. A portion of this poem has been translated by Gray, of which the following is an extract. To catch Wraith's Vale, in glittering row, twice two hundred warriors go, every warrior's manly neck, chains of regal honour deck, wreathed in many a golden link, from the golden cup they drink, nectar that the bees produce, or the grape's exalted juice. Flushed with mirth and hope they burn, but none to Cathreach's vale return, save Aaron the brave and Conan strong, bursting through the bloody throng, and I, the meanest of them all, that live to weep and sing their fall. The works of Taliesin are of much more questionable authenticity. There is a story of the adventures of Taliesin so strongly marked with mythical traits as to cast suspicion on the writings attributed to him. This story will be found in the subsequent pages. THE TRIADS The triads are a peculiar species of poetical composition, of which the Welsh bards have left numerous examples. They are enumerations of a triad of persons, or events, or observations, strung together in one short sentence. This form of composition, originally invented in all likelihood to assist the memory, has been raised by the Welsh to a degree of eloquence, of which it hardly at first sight appears susceptible. The triads are of all ages, some of them probably as old as anything in the language. Short as they are individually, the collection in the Mavurian archaeology occupies more than one hundred and seventy pages of double columns. We will give some specimens, beginning with personal triads, and giving the first place to one of King Arthur's own composition. I have three heroes in battle, Mael the Tall, and Thyr with his army, and Caradoc, the Pillar of Wales. The three principal bards of the island of Britain, Merlin Ambrose, Merlin the son of Morfin, called also Merlin the Wild, and Taliesin the chief of the bards. The three golden-tongued knights of the court of Arthur, Gawain son of Guar, Drudvas son of Triffin, and Ewad son of Magad up Uther. The three honourable feasts of the island of Britain, the feast of Caswallon, after repelling Julius Caesar from this isle, the feast of Aurelius Ambrosius, after he had conquered the Saxons, and the feast of King Arthur, at Carleon upon Usk. Guinevere, the daughter of Lagodian the giant, bad when little, worse when great. Next follow some moral triads. Hast thou heard what Drumheddick sung, an ancient watchman on the castle walls? A refusal is better than a promise unperformed. Hast thou heard what Lenwig sung, the noble chief wearing the golden torques? The grave is better than a life of want. Hast thou heard what Garslet sung, the Irishman whom it is safe to follow? Sin is bad if long pursued. Hast thou heard what Avon sung, the son of Taliesin of the recording verse? The cheek will not conceal the anguish of the heart. Didst thou hear what Lowark sung, the intrepid and brave old man? Greet kindly, though there be no acquaintance. End of section 24《Two from the Mabinogian from Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. The Mabinogian, Chapter 2. The Lady of the Fountain, Kynon's Adventure. King Arthur was at Carleon upon Usk. 
and one day he sat in his chamber, and with him were Owain, the son of Urien, and Kynon, the son of Clindo, and Kay, the son of Kyner, and Guinevere and her handmaidens at needlework by the window. In the centre of the chamber King Arthur sat, upon a seat of green rushes. Footnote. The use of green rushes in apartments was by no means peculiar to the court of Carleon upon Usk. Our ancestors had a great predilection for them, and they seem to have constituted an essential article, not only of comfort but of luxury. The custom of strewing the floor with rushes is well known to have existed in England during the Middle Ages, and also in France. End footnote over which was spread a covering of flame-colored satin, and a cushion of red satin was under his elbow. Then Arthur spoke. If I thought you would not disparage me, said he, I would sleep while I wait for my repast, and you can entertain one another with relating tales, and can obtain a flagon of mead and some meat from Kay. And the king went to sleep. And Kynon the son of Clindo asked Kay for that which Arthur had promised them. I too will have a good tale which he promised me, said Kay. Nay, answered Kynon, fairer will it be for thee to fulfill Arthur's behest in the first place, and then we will tell thee the best tale that we know. So Kay went to the kitchen and to the mead cellar, and returned, bearing a flagon of mead and a golden goblet, and a handful of skewers, upon which were broiled collops of meat. Then they ate the collops, and began to drink the mead. Now, said Kay, it is time for you to give me my story. Kynon, said Owain, do thou pay to Kay the tale that is his due. I will do so, answered Kynon. I was the only son of my mother and father, and I was exceedingly aspiring, and my daring was very great. I thought there was no enterprise in the world too mighty for me, and after I had achieved all the adventures that were in my own country, I equipped myself, and set forth to journey through deserts and distant regions. And at length it chanced that I came to the fairest valley in the world, wherein were trees all of equal growth, and a river ran through the valley, and a path was by the side of the river. And I followed the path until midday, and continued my journey along the remainder of the valley until the evening, and at the extremity of the plain I came to a large and lustrous castle, at the foot of which was a torrent and I approached the castle, and there I beheld two youths with yellow curling hair, each with a frontlet of gold upon his head, and clad in a garment of yellow satin. And they had gold clasps upon their insteps. In the hand of each of them was an ivory bow, strung with the sinews of the stag, and their arrows and their shafts were of the bone of the whale, and were winged with peacock's feathers. The shafts also had golden heads, and they had daggers with blades of gold, and with hilts of the bone of the whale, and they were shooting at a mark. And a little way from them I saw a man in the prime of life, with his beard newly shorn, clad in a robe and mantle of yellow satin, and round the top of his mantle was a band of gold lace. On his feet were shoes of variegated leather. Footnote. Cordwall is the word in the original, and from the manner in which it is used, it is evidently intended for the French cordouan or cordovan leather, which derived its name from Cordova, where it was manufactured. From this comes also our English word cordwainer, and footnote, fastened by two bosses of gold. When I saw him, I went towards him and saluted him, and such was his courtesy that he no sooner received my greeting than he returned it, and he went with me towards the castle. Now there were no dwellers in the castle, except those who were in one hall, and there I saw four and twenty damsels embroidering satin at a window, and this I tell thee, Kay, that the least fair of them was fairer than the fairest maid thou didst ever behold in the island of Britain, and the least lovely of them was more lovely than Guinevere, the wife of Arthur, when she appeared loveliest at the feast of Easter. They rose up at my coming, and six of them took my horse, and divested me of my armor, and six others took my arms and washed them in a vessel till they were perfectly bright, and the third six spread cloths upon the tables and prepared meat, and the fourth six took off my soiled garments and placed others upon me, namely an undervest and a doublet of fine linen, and a robe and a surcoat, and a mantle of yellow satin, with a broad gold band upon the mantle, and they placed cushions both beneath and around me, 
with coverings of red linen, and I sat down. Now the six maidens who had taken my horse unharnessed him as well as if they had been the best squires in the island of Britain. Then behold, they brought bowls of silver, wherein was water to wash and towels of linen, some green and some white. And I washed. And in a little while the man sat down at the table. And I sat next to him, and below me sat all the maidens, except those who waited on us. And the table was of silver, and the cloths upon the table were of linen. And no vessel was served upon the table that was not either of gold or of silver, or of buffalo horn. And our meat was brought to us. And verily, Kay, I saw there every sort of meat, and every sort of liquor that I ever saw elsewhere. But the meat and the liquor were better served there than I ever saw them in any other place. Until the repast was half over, neither the man nor any one of the damsels spoke a single word to me. But when the man perceived that it would be more agreeable for me to converse than to eat any more, he began to inquire of me who I was. Then I told the man who I was, and what was the cause of my journey, and said that I was seeking whether any one was superior to me, or whether I could gain mastery over all. The man looked upon me, and he smiled and said, If I did not fear to do thee a mischief, I would show thee that which thou seekest. Then I desired him to speak freely, and he said, Sleep here to-night, and in the morning arise early, and take the road upwards through the valley, until thou readiest the wood. A little way within the wood thou wilt come to a large sheltered glade, with a mound in the centre, and thou wilt see a black man of great stature on the top of the mound. He has but one foot and one eye in the middle of his forehead. He is the woodward of that wood and thou wilt see a thousand wild animals grazing around him. Inquire of him the way out of the glade, and he will reply to thee briefly, and will point out the road by which thou shalt find that which thou art in quest of. And long seemed that night to me, and the next morning I arose and equipped myself, and mounted my horse, and proceeded straight through the valley to the wood, and at length I arrived in the glade and the black man was there, sitting upon the top of the mound, and I was three times more astonished at the number of wild animals that I beheld than the man had said I should be. Then I inquired of him the way, and he asked me roughly whither I would go. And when I had told him who I was and what I sought, Take, said he, that path that leads toward the head of the glade, and there thou wilt find an open space like to a large valley, and in the midst of it a tall tree. Under this tree is a fountain, and by the side of the fountain a marble slab, and on the marble slab a silver bowl, attached by a chain of silver, that it may not be carried away. Take the bowl and throw a bowl full of water on the slab, and if thou dost not find trouble in that adventure, thou needest not seek it during the rest of thy life. So I journeyed on until I reached the summit of the steep, and there I found everything as the black man had described it to me and I went up to the tree, and beneath it I saw the fountain, and by its side the marble slab, and the silver bowl fastened by the chain. Then I took the bowl, and cast a bowl full of water upon the slab, and immediately I heard a mighty peal of thunder, so that heaven and earth seemed to tremble with its fury. And after the thunder came a shower, and of a truth I tell thee, Kay, that it was such a shower as neither man nor beast could endure and live. I turned my horse's flank toward the shower, and placed the beak of my shield over his head and neck, while I held the upper part of it over my own neck, and thus I withstood the shower. And presently the sky became clear, and with that, behold, the birds lighted upon the tree and sang. And truly, Kay, I never heard any melody equal to that, either before or since. And when I was most charmed with listening to the birds, lo! A chiding voice was heard of one approaching me and saying, O oh, knight, what has brought thee hither? What evil have I done to thee that thou shouldst act towards me and my possessions as thou hast this day? Dost thou not know that the shower to-day has left in my dominions neither man nor beast alive that was exposed to it? And thereupon, behold, a knight on a black horse appeared, clothed in jet-black velvet, and with a tabard of black linen about him. And we charged each other, and, as the onset was furious, it was not long before I was overthrown. Then the knight passed the shaft of his lance through the bridle rein of my horse, 
and rode off with the two horses, leaving me where I was. And he did not even bestow so much notice upon me as to imprison me, nor did he despoil me of my arms. So I returned along the road by which I had come, and when I reached the glade where the black man was, I confessed to thee, Kay, it is a marvel that I did not melt down into a liquid pool through the shame that I felt at the black man's derision. And that night I came to the same castle where I had spent the night preceding, and I was more agreeably entertained that night than I had been the night before. And I conversed freely with the inmates of the castle, and none of them alluded to my expedition to the fountain, neither did I mention it to any. And I remained there that night. When I arose on the morrow, I found ready saddled a dark bay palfrey, with nostrils as red as scarlet, and after putting on my armor and leaving there my blessing, I returned to my own court. And that horse I still possess, and he is in the stable yonder, and I declare that I would not part with him for the best palfrey in the island of Britain. Now of a truth, Kay, no man ever before confessed to an adventure so much to his own discredit, and verily it seems strange to me that neither before nor since have I heard of any person who knew of this adventure, and that the subject of it should exist within King Arthur's dominions without any other person lighting upon it. End of chapter 2The Mabinogian from Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. The Mabinogian. Chapter 3. The Lady of the Fountain Continued. Owain's Adventure. Footnote. Amongst all the characters of early British history, none is the more interesting, or occupies more conspicuous place, than the hero of this tale. Orion, his father, was Prince of Reged, a district comprising the present Cumberland and part of the adjacent country. His valour, and the consideration in which he was held, are a frequent theme of bardic song and form the subject of several very spirited odes by Taliesin. Among the triads there is one relating to him. It is thus translated. Three knights of battle were in court of Arthur Cadar, the Earl of Cornwall, Launcelot du Lac, and Owain the son of Orion. And this was their characteristic, that they would not retreat from battle, neither for spear nor for arrow, nor for sword. And Arthur never had shame in battle the day he saw their faces there, and they were called the Knights of Battle. End footnote. Now, quoth Owain, would it not be well to go and endeavour to discover that place? By the hand of my friend, said Kay, often dost thou utter that with thy tongue which thou wouldest not make good with thy deeds. In very truth, said Guinevere, it were better thou wert hanged, Kay, than to use such uncourteous speech towards a man like Owain. By the hand of my friend, good lady, said Kay, thy praise of Owain is not greater than mine. With that, Arthur awoke, and asked if he had not been sleeping a little. Yes, lord, answered Owain, thou hast slept a while. Is it time for us to go to meet? It is, lord said Owain. Then the horn for washing was sounded, and the king and all his household sat down to eat, and when the meal was ended, Owain withdrew to his lodging, and made ready his horse and his arms. On the morrow, with the dawn of day, he put on his armour, and mounted his charger, and travelled through distant lands, and over desert mountains and at length he arrived at the valley which Kynon had described to him, and he was certain that it was the same that he sought. And journeying along the valley, by the side of the river, he followed its course till he came to the plain and within sight of the castle. When he approached the castle, he saw the youths shooting with their bows, in the place where Kynon had seen them, and the yellow man, to whom the castle belonged, 
standing hard by, and no sooner had Owain saluted the yellow man than he was saluted by him in return. And he went forward towards the castle, and there he saw the chamber, and when he had entered the chamber he beheld the maidens working at satin embroidery in chains of gold, and their beauty and their comeliness seemed to Owain far greater than Kynon had represented to him, and they arose to wait upon Owain, as they had done to Kynon, and the meal which they set before him gave even more satisfaction to Owain than it had done to Kynon. About the middle of the repast, the yellow man asked Owain the object of his journey, and Owain made it known to him, and said, I am in quest of the knight who guards the fountain. Upon this, the yellow man smiled, and said that he was as loath to point out that adventure to him as he had been to Kynon. However, he described the whole to Owain, and they retired to rest. The next morning, Owain found his horse made ready for him by the damsels, and he set forward and came to the glade where the black man was. And the stature of the black man seemed more wonderful to Owain than it had done to Kynon, and Owain asked of him his road, and he showed it to him. And Owain followed the road till he came to the green tree, and he beheld the fountain, and the slab beside the fountain, with a bowl upon it. And Owain took the bowl, and threw a bowl full of water upon the slab. And lo, the thunder was heard, and after the thunder came the shower, more violent than Kynon had described. And after the shower, the sky became bright. And immediately the birds came and settled upon the tree and sang. And when their song was most pleasing to Owain, he beheld a knight coming towards him through the valley and he prepared to receive him, and encountered him violently. Having broken both their lances, they drew their swords and fought blade to blade. Then Owain struck the knight a blow through his helmet, headpiece and visor, and through the skin, and the flesh, and the bone, until it wounded the very brain. Then the black knight felt that he had received a mortal wound, upon which he turned his horse's head and fled. And Owain pursued him, and followed close upon him, although he was not near enough to strike him with his sword. Then Owain descried a vast and resplendent castle, and they came to the castle gate. And the black knight was allowed to enter, and the portcullis was let fall upon Owain, and it struck his horse behind the saddle, and cut him in two, and carried away the rolls of the spurs that were upon Owain's heels and the portcullis descended to the floor, and the rowels of the spurs and part of the horse were without, and Owain with the other part of the horse remained between the two gates, and the inner gate was closed, so that Owain could not go thence. And Owain was in a perplexing situation. And while he was in this state, he could see through an aperture in the gate a street facing him, with a row of houses on each side and he beheld a maiden, with yellow, curling hair, and a frontlet of gold upon her head, and she was clad in a dress of yellow satin, and on her feet were shoes of variegated leather, and she approached the gate, and desired that it should be opened. Heaven knows, lady, said Owain, it is no more possible for me to open to thee from hence, than it is for thee to set me free. And he told her his name, and who he was. Truly, said the damsel, it is very sad that thou canst not be released, and every woman ought to succour thee, for I know there is no one more faithful in the service of ladies than thou. Therefore, quoth she, whatever is in my power to do for thy release, I will do it. Take this ring, and put it on thy finger, with a stone inside thy hand, and close thy hand upon the stone and as long as thou concealest it, it will conceal thee. When they come forth to fetch thee, they will be much grieved that they cannot find thee, and I will await thee on the horse-block yonder, and thou wilt be able to see me, though I cannot see thee. Therefore come and place thy hand upon my shoulder, that I may know that thou art near me, 
and by the way that I go hence do thou accompany me. Then the maiden went away from Owain, and he did all that she had told him, and the people of the castle came to seek Owain to put him to death, and when they found nothing but the half of his horse, they were sorely grieved. And Owain vanished from among them, and went to the maiden, and placed his hand upon her shoulder, whereupon she set off, and Owain followed her, until they came to the door of a large and beautiful chamber, and the maiden opened it, and they went in. And Owain looked around the chamber, and behold, there was not a single nail in it that was not painted with gorgeous colours, and there was not a single panel that had not sundry images in gold portrayed upon it. The maiden kindled a fire, and took water in a silver bowl, and gave Owain water to wash. Then she placed before him a silver table inlaid with gold, upon which was a cloth of yellow linen, and she brought him food, and, of a truth, Owain never saw any kind of meat that was not there in abundance, but it was better cooked there than he had ever found it in any other place. And there was not one vessel from which he was served that was not of gold or of silver. And Owain eat and drank until late in the afternoon, when, lo, they heard a mighty clamour in the castle, and Owain asked the maiden what it was. They are administering extreme unction, said she, to the nobleman who owns the castle. And she prepared a couch for Owain, which was meet for Arthur himself, and Owain went to sleep. And a little after daybreak he heard an exceeding loud clamour and wailing, and he asked the maiden what was the cause of it. They are bearing to the church the body of the nobleman who owned the castle. And Owain rose up and clothed himself, and opened a window of the chamber, and looked towards the castle, and he could see neither the bounds nor the extent of the hosts that filled the streets. And they were fully armed, and a vast number of women were with them, both on horseback and on foot and all the ecclesiastics in the city singing. In the midst of the throng he beheld the bier, over which was a veil of white linen, and wax tapers were burning beside and around it, and none that supported the bier was lower in rank than a powerful baron. Never did Owain see an assemblage so gorgeous with silk and satin. Footnote before the 6th century, all the silk used by Europeans had been brought to them by the Ceres, the ancestors of the present Bukharians, whence it derived its Latin name of Serica. In 551, the silkworm was brought by two monks to Constantinople, but the manufacture of silk was confined to the Greek Empire till the year 1130, when Roger, king of Sicily, returning from a crusade, collected some manufacturers from Athens and Corinth, and established them at Palermo, whence the trade was gradually disseminated over Italy. The varieties of silk stuffs known at this time were velvet, satin, which was called samite, and taffety, called sendal or sendal, all of which were occasionally stitched with gold and silver. End footnote. And Following the train, he beheld a lady with yellow hair falling over her shoulders, and stained with blood, and about her a dress of yellow satin, which was torn. Upon her feet were shoes of variegated leather, and it was marvel that the ends of her fingers were not bruised from the violence with which she smote her hands together. Truly, she would have been the fairest lady Owain ever saw, had she been in her usual guise and her cry was louder than the shout of the men, or the clamour of the trumpets. No sooner had he beheld the lady than he became inflamed with her love, so that it took entire possession of him. Then he inquired of the maiden who the lady was. Heaven knows, replied the maiden, she is the fairest, and the most chaste, and the most liberal, and the most noble of women. She is my mistress, and she is called the Countess of the Fountain, 
the wife of him whom thou didst slay yesterday. Verily, said Owain, she is the woman that I love best. Verily, said the maiden, she shall also love thee, not a little. Then the maiden prepared a repast for Owain, and truly he thought he had never before so good a meal, nor was he ever so well served. Then she left him and went towards the castle. When she came there, she found nothing but mourning and sorrow, and the countess in her chamber could not bear the sight of any one through grief. Luned, for that was the name of the maiden, saluted her, but the countess answered her not. And the maiden bent down towards her, and said, What aileth thee, that thou answereth no one to-day? Luned, said the countess, what change hath befallen thee? that thou hast not come to visit me in my grief. It was wrong in thee, and I so sorely afflicted. Truly, said Luned, I thought thy good sense was greater than I find it to be. Is it well for thee to mourn after that good man, or for anything else that thou canst not have? I declare to heaven, said the countess, that in the whole world there is not a man equal to him. Not so, said Luned, for an ugly man would be as good as or better than he. I declare to heaven, said the countess, that were it not repugnant to me to put to death one whom I have brought up, I would have thee executed for making such a comparison to me. As it is, I will banish thee. I am glad said Luned, that thou hast no other cause to do so than that I would have been of service to thee, where thou didst not know what was to thine advantage. Henceforth, evil betide whichever of us shall make the first advance towards reconciliation to the other, whether I should seek an invitation from thee, or thou of thine own accord should send to invite. With that, Luned went forth, and the countess arose and followed her to the door of the chamber, and began coughing loudly. And when Luned looked back, the countess beckoned to her, and she returned to the countess. In truth, said the countess, evil is thy disposition, but if thou knowest what is to my advantage, declare it to me. I will do so, said she. Thou knowest that, except by warfare and arms, it is impossible for thee to preserve thy possessions. Delay not, therefore, to seek someone who can defend them. And how can I do that? said the countess. I will tell thee, said Luned, unless thou canst defend the fountain, thou canst not maintain thy dominions, and no one can defend the fountain, except it be a knight of Arthur's household. I will go to Arthur's court, and ill betide me if I return not thence with a warrior who can guard the fountain as well as, or even better than, he who defended it formerly. That will be hard to perform, said the countess. Go, however, and make proof of that which thou hast promised. Luned set out, under the pretense of going to Arthur's court. But she went back to the mansion where she had left Owain, and she tarried there as long as it might have taken her to travel to the court of King Arthur and back. And at the end of that time she apparelled herself, and went to visit the countess. And the countess was much rejoiced when she saw her, and inquired what news she brought from the court. I bring thee the best of news, said Luned, for I have compassed the object of my mission. When wilt thou that I should present to thee the chieftain who has come with me hither? Bring him here to visit me to-morrow, said the countess, and I will cause the town to be assembled by that time. And Luned returned home, and the next day at noon Owain arrayed himself in a coat and a surcoat and a mantle of yellow satin, upon which was a broad band of gold lace, and on his feet were high shoes of variegated leather which were fastened by golden clasps in the form of lions, and they proceeded to the chamber of the countess. Right glad was the countess of their coming, and she gazed steadfastly upon Owain, and said, Luned, 
This knight has not the look of a traveller. What harm is there in that lady? said Luned. I am certain, said the countess, that no other man than this chased the soul from the body of my lord. So much the better for thee, lady, said Luned, for had he not been stronger than thy lord, he could not have deprived him of life. There is no remedy for that which is past, be it as it may. Go back to thine abode, said the countess, and I will take counsel. The next day the countess caused all her subjects to assemble, and showed them that her earldom was left defenceless, and that it could not be protected but with horse and arms and military skill. Therefore, said she, this is what I offer for your choice. Either let one of you take me, or give your consent for me to take a husband from elsewhere, to defend my dominions. So they came to the determination that it was better that she should have permission to marry someone from elsewhere, and thereupon she sent for the bishops and archbishops to celebrate her nuptials with Owain, and the men of the Oldham did Owain homage. And Owain defended the fountain with lance and sword, and this is the manner in which he defended it. Whensoever a knight came there, he overthrew him, and sold him for his full worth. And what he thus gained, he divided among his barons and his knights, and no man in the whole world could be more beloved than he was by his subjects. And it was thus for the space of three years. Footnote. There exists an ancient poem, printed among those of Taliesin, called The Elegy of Owain ap Urien, and containing several very beautiful and spirited passages. It commences, The soul of Owain ap Urien, may its lord consider its exigencies, Reged's chief the green turf covers. In the course of this elegy, the bard, alluding to the incessant warfare with which this chieftain harassed his Saxon foes, exclaims, could England sleep with a light upon her eyes? End footnote. End of chapter 3. Of the Mabinogion, from Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by David Barnes. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. The Mabinogion. Chapter 4. The Lady of the Fountain. Continued. Gawain's Adventure. It befell that, as Gawain went forth one day with King Arthur, he perceived him to be very sad and sorrowful. And Gawain was much grieved to see Arthur in this state, and he questioned him, saying, O oh my lord, what has befallen thee? In sooth, Gawain, said Arthur, I am grieving concerning Owain, whom I have lost these three years and I shall certainly die if the fourth year pass without my seeing him. Now I am sure that it is through the tale which Kynon, the son of Clidno, related, that I have lost Owain. There is no need for thee, said Gawain, to summon to arms thy whole dominions on this account, for thou thyself and the men of thy household will be able to avenge Owain if he be slain, or to set him free if he be in prison, and if alive to bring him back with thee. And it was settled according to what Gawain had said. Then Arthur and the men of his household prepared to go and seek Owain, and Kynon, the son of Clidno, acted as their guide. And Arthur came to the castle where Kynon had been before, and when he came there the youths were shooting in the same place, and the yellow man was standing hard by. When the yellow man saw Arthur, he greeted him, and invited him to the castle. And Arthur accepted his invitation, and they entered the castle together. And great as was the number of his retinue, their presence was scarcely observed in the castle, so vast was its extent. And the maidens rose up to wait on them, 
and the service of the maidens appeared to them all to excel any attendance they had ever met with, and even the pages who had charge of the horses were no worse served that night than Arthur himself would have been in his own palace. The next morning Arthur set out thence with Kynon for his guide, and came to the place where the black man was and the stature of the black man was more surprising to Arthur than it had been represented to him. And they came to the top of the wooded steep, and traversed the valley, till they reached the green tree, where they saw the fountain, and the bowl, and the slab. And upon that Kay came to Arthur, and spoke to him. My lord, said he, I know the meaning of all this, and my request is that thou wilt permit me to throw the water on the slab, and to receive the first adventure that may befall. And Arthur gave him leave. Then Kay threw a bowlful of water upon the slab, and immediately there came the thunder, and after the thunder the shower, and such a thunderstorm they had never known before. After the shower had ceased, the sky became clear, and on looking at the tree they beheld it completely leafless. Then the birds descended upon the tree, and the song of the birds was far sweeter than any strain they had ever heard before. Then they beheld a knight, on a coal-black horse, clothed in black satin, coming rapidly towards them, and Kay met him and encountered him, and it was not long before Kay was overthrown, and the knight withdrew, and Arthur and his host encamped for the night. And when they arose in the morning, they perceived the signal of combat upon the lance of the knight. Then, one by one, all the household of Arthur went forth to combat the knight, until there was not one that was not overthrown by him except Arthur and Gawain and Arthur armed himself to encounter the knight. O oh, my lord, said Gawain, permit me to fight with him first. And Arthur permitted him, and he went forth to meet the knight, having over himself and his horse a satin robe of honour, which had been sent him by the daughter of the Earl of Rangir, and in this dress he was not known by any of the host, and they charged each other, and fought all that day until the evening and neither of them was able to unhorse the other. And so it was the next day. They broke their lances in the shock, but neither of them could obtain the mastery. On the third day they fought with exceeding strong lances, and they were incensed with rage, and fought furiously, even until noon, and they gave each other such a shock that the girths of their horses were broken, so that they fell over their horses' croppers to the ground, and they rose up speedily, and drew their swords, and resumed the combat, and all they that witnessed their encounter felt assured that they had never before seen two men so valiant or so powerful and had it been midnight it would have been light from the fire that flashed from their weapons and the knight gave Gawain a blow that turned his helmet from off his face, so that the knight saw that it was Gawain. Then Owain said, My lord Gawain, I did not know thee for my cousin, owing to the robe of honour that enveloped thee. Take my sword and my arms. Said Gawain, Thou, Owain, art the victor, take thou my sword. And with that Arthur saw that they were conversing, and advanced toward them. My lord Arthur, said Gawain, here is Owain who has vanquished me and will not take my arms. My lord, said Owain, it is he that has vanquished me and he will not take my sword. Give me your swords, said Arthur, and then neither of you has vanquished the other. Then Owain put his arms around Arthur's neck and they embraced and all the host hurried forward to see Owain, and to embrace him, and there was nigh being a loss of life, so great was the press. And they retired that night, and the next day Arthur prepared to depart. My lord, said Owain, this is not well of thee, 
for I have been absent from thee these three years, and during all that time up to this very day I have been preparing a banquet for thee, knowing that thou wouldst come to seek me. Tarry with me, therefore, until thou and thy attendants have recovered the fatigues of the journey, and have been anointed. And they all proceeded to the castle of the Countess of the Fountain, and the banquet which had been three years preparing was consumed in three months. Never had they a more delicious or agreeable banquet, and Arthur prepared to depart. Then he sent an embassy to the countess to beseech her to permit Owain to go with him for the space of three months, that he might show him to the nobles and the fair dames of the island of Britain. And the countess gave her consent, although it was very painful to her, so Owain came with Arthur to the island of Britain, and when he was once more amongst his kindred and friends, he remained three years instead of three months with them. THE ADVENTURE OF THE LION And as Owain one day sat at meat in the city of Caerleon upon Usk, behold, a damsel entered the hall upon a bay horse with a curling mane, and covered with foam, and the bridle, and as much as was seen of the saddle, were of gold, and the damsel was arrayed in a dress of yellow satin, and she came up to Owain, and took the ring off from his hand. Thus, said she, shall be treated the deceiver, the traitor, the faithless, the disgraced, and the beardless. And she turned her horse's head, and departed. Footnote. The custom of riding into a hall while the Lord and his guests sat at meat might be illustrated by numerous passages of ancient romance and history, but a quotation from Chaucer's beautiful and half-told tale, The Cambuscan, is sufficient. And so befell that after the Thrida course, while that this king sat thus in his nobly, hiking his minstrels their fingers play, before him at his board deliciously, in at the haller door all suddenly, there came a knicked upon a stair of brass, and in his horn a broad mirror of glass, upon his thumb he had of gold a ring, and by his side a naked sword hanging, and up he rideth to the higher board, in all the haller nay was there spoke a word, for merrily of this knicked, him to behold full busily they waiten, young and old. End of footnote. Then his adventure came to Owain's remembrance, and he was sorrowful, and having finished eating, he went to his own abode, and made preparations that night, and the next day he arose, but did not go to the court, nor did he return to the countess of the fountain, but wandered to the distant parts of the earth, and to uncultivated mountains, and he remained there, until all his apparel was worn out, and his body was wasted away, and his hair was grown long. And he went about with the wild beasts, and fed with them, until they became familiar with him. But at length he became so weak, that he could no longer bear them company. Then he descended from the mountains to the valley, and came to a park that was the fairest in the world, and belonged to a charitable lady. One day the lady and her attendants went forth to walk by a lake that was in the middle of the park, and they saw the form of a man lying as if dead, and they were terrified. Nevertheless they went near him and touched him, and they saw that there was life in him. And the lady returned to the castle and took a flask full of precious ointment and gave it to one of her maidens. Go with this, said she, and take with thee on the horse and clothing, and place them near the man we saw just now, and anoint him with this balsam near his heart, and if there is life in him he will revive through the efficiency of this balsam. Then watch what he will do. And the maiden departed from her, and went and poured of the balsam upon a wain, and left the horse and the garments hard by, and went a little way off, and hid herself to watch him. In a short time she saw him begin to move, 
and he rose up and looked at his person and became ashamed of the unseemliness of his appearance. Then he perceived the horse and the garments that were near him, and he clothed himself and with difficulty mounted the horse. Then the damsel discovered herself to him and saluted him, and he and the maiden proceeded to the castle, and the maiden conducted him to a pleasant chamber and kindled a fire and left him. And he stayed at the castle three months till he was restored to his former guise and became even more comely than he had ever been before. And Owain rendered signal service to the lady in a controversy with a powerful neighbour so that he made ample requital to her for her hospitality, and he took his departure. And as he journeyed, he heard a loud yelling in a wood, and it was repeated a second and a third time. And Owain went towards the spot, and beheld a huge craggy mound in the middle of the wood, and on the side of which was a grey rock, and there was a cleft in the rock, and a serpent was within the cleft, and near the rock stood a black lion, and every time the lion sought to go thence the serpent darted towards him to attack him, and Owain unsheathed his sword and drew near to the rock, and as the serpent sprung out he struck him with his sword and cut him in two, and he dried his sword and went on his way as before. But behold, the lion followed him and played about him, as though it had been a greyhound that he had reared. They proceeded thus throughout the day until the evening, and when it was time for Owain to take his rest, he dismounted and turned his horse loose in a flat and wooded meadow. And he struck fire, and when the fire was kindled, the lion brought him fuel enough to last for three nights. And the lion disappeared, and presently the lion returned, bearing a fine large roebuck, and he threw it down before Owain, who went towards the fire with it. And Owain took the roebuck, and skinned it, and placed collops of its meat upon skewers around the fire. The rest of the buck he gave to the lion to devour. While he was so employed, he heard a deep groan near him, and a second, and a third, and the place whence the groans proceeded was a cave in the rock. And Owain went near, and called out to know who it was that groaned so piteously. And a voice answered, I am Luned, the handmaiden of the Countess of the Fountain. And what dost thou here? said he. I am imprisoned, said she, on account of the knight who came from Arthur's court and married the Countess and he stayed a short time with her, but he afterwards departed for the court of Arthur, and has not returned since. And two of the countess's pages traduced him, and called him a deceiver. And because I said I would vouch for it, that he would come before long and maintain his cause against both of them, they imprisoned me in this cave, and said that I should be put to death, unless he came to deliver me by a certain day. And that is no further off than to-morrow, and I have no one to send to seek him for me. His name is Owain, the son of Urian. And art thou certain that if that knight knew all this, he would come to thy rescue? I am almost certain of it, said she. When the collops were cooked, Owain divided them into two parts, between himself and the maiden, and then Owain laid himself down to sleep and never did sentinel keep stricter watch over his lord than the lion that night over Owain. And the next day there came the two pages with a great troop of attendants to take Luned from her cell and put her to death. And Owain asked them what charge they had against her, and they told him of the compact that was between them, as the maiden had done the night before. And, said they, Owain has failed her, therefore we are taking her to be burnt. Truly, said Owain, he is a good knight, and if he knew that the maiden was in such peril, I marvel that he came not to her rescue. But if you will accept me in his stead, I will do battle with you. We will, said the youth. And they attacked Owain, and he was hard beset by them, and with that 
the lion came to Owain's assistance, and they too got the better of the young men, and they said to him, Chieftain, it was not agreed that we should fight save with thyself alone, and it is harder for us to contend with yonder animal than with thee. And Owain put the lion in the place where Luned had been imprisoned, and blocked up the door with stones, and he went to fight with the young men as before. But Owain had not his usual strength, and the two youths pressed hard upon him, and the lion roared incessantly at seeing Owain in trouble. And he burst through the wall until he found a way out, and rushed upon the young men and instantly slew them. So Luned was saved from being burned. Then Owain returned with Luned to the castle of the Lady of the Fountain, and when he went thence he took the countess with him to Arthur's court, and she was his wife as long as she lived. End of chapter 4